welcome back to the Almost Forgotten Podcast, Black American History Lectures Series, with yours truly, Professor Daryl Brackeen Jr. here, the author of the book, The Almost Forgotten, uh, highlighting America's first Black American congressman, and it is my privilege and honor to be with each and every one of you for part two of really a Freedom School uh, series on Black history. This is part two. So if you're watching this for the first time, you have to go back and check out episode one where we did a lot of foundational work and references. While I may mention some of those things again, uh, I will not be going into detail. So here's what I don't want to happen. In the comments, you're asking basic questions that were already reviewed in episode one. Please just take a moment, find the link, and uh, review episode one before you continue uh, with part two of this awesome series um, that we're entitling the Black History Lecture Series uh, of the Almost Forgotten Podcast. This is season two, which is phenomenal. Uh, season one, uh, you can find on all major platforms where there are podcasts, Spotify, Apple Tunes, we're even on iHeartRadio Podcast. Uh, wherever podcasts are found, you can find the first season where we highlighted just a few of the congressmen within the book, um, the Almost Forgotten series. The first Black American congressman uh, during the Reconstruction era and the dawn of the Black political age uh, for the first Black American congressman to be elected post the Civil War. Some of them were enslaved individuals, uh, others were free, but nonetheless were down for the fight of the liberation of uh, Black Americans and uh, them receiving their full rights during that time. So once more, if you are watching this episode, this is part two. You have to take some time, find the link. It's somewhere on this page or even on this video. Please go to part one first because there's some things that you're going to need for foundational knowledge before you move forward. Now, uh, today, uh, as I promised, we're going to begin to have a discussion about uh, what it means to uh, clarify what oral uh, historical tradition is about and why that matters in the context of Black history. And um, I have to say this too, uh, it seems as if this movement has really um, uh, brought out a lot of individuals who just simply can't uh, conceive the reason for the need for Black history. Uh, so again, um, feel free to go back to the first episode where we very clearly and greatly define why Black history matters or even why we have to do it. I'll quickly say it right now. If it was not for systematic racism and the uh, systematic um, running of simply trying to remove Black history uh, from American history, there really wouldn't have been a need to have to highlight uh, Black history and any other history of any uh, subordinate groups within a dominant culture that seeks to raise up whiteness, the system, not in skin color. So let me just be clear about that. We're, when we refer to racism, we are talking about the system. Uh, and within the system, it has created the construct of um, the use of skin tone and skin, uh, skin hues uh, as a way to uh, say one group is better uh, than the other. In our context, we are addressing Black history as a form of uh, really to combat uh, what has uh, been systematically uh, the raising of the construct not the skin color, the, co the systematic construct, and the idea of whiteness. And again, got to go back to part one uh, to get a better understanding and a deep dive on what we mean by that. So, um, the, uh, be before we take the next step on to why oral history tradition matters, I want to encourage each and every one of you to uh, please follow us, like, and share 
at Brackeen TV on all platforms where uh, social media platforms are. If you have any questions or anything that you want me to highlight, clarify. If you haven't watched part two, all part one and two already, uh, feel free to email us at management at djbjmotivationalmedia.com or message us on all social media platforms at Brackeen TV or uh, where you find Daryl Brackeen Jr. You can feel free uh, to message us there uh, with your thoughts, questions, or even some things that um, uh, may uh, you would like to see incorporated uh, in this lecture series. Again, it would take me an entire year to give a comprehensive lecture series, but I'm going to do my best to try to walk us through uh, from the uh, 1500s, a little bit of the four, late 1400s, all the way through the 1900s in terms of uh, Black history in its context. Also, uh, I want to just be very clear. I have chosen to purposefully not do this series in Black History Month because it is my belief, my wholehearted belief, that Black history uh, needs to be taught 365 uh, every single day of the year, uh, every week of the year. Uh, so um, uh, we are purposely not doing this series in February, although uh, we greatly appreciate if you restream uh, all throughout the month of February as well as to uh, begin a conversation in your local community about how to incorporate Black history uh, in and the oral traditions that come along with that. So again, please like, please share. Uh, many of you have already done so. We have a great following that's already uh, upticking it's amazing to see you know along with promoting knowledge you also have your haters out there so i ask each and every one of you if you are watching this and you're support of this movement uh please don't let the negativity stop you from liking and sharing uh again this series is meant to combat racism at its core and to shake the foundation uh, for how uh, we address um the the histories of individuals that have often gone unnoticed and untold. So we are going to jump right in, my friends, into the next part of the Almost Forgotten Podcast, Black American History Lecture Series, and this is part two. Uh, again, I am your professor, Daryl Brackeen Jr., um, and I talk about uh, my background uh, throughout the um, uh, part one, quite frankly, and you can feel free to uh, hear a little bit more about my background uh, in part one. All right, so we're going to jump right in. Again, uh, my book is available on Amazon.com, or you can find it online at BarnesandNoble.com. Again, the almost forgotten America's first Black American congressman uh, by yours truly. Please pick up a copy. We also have it in ebook form. We have it in hardcover. If you need to get into your local school districts, uh, re please reach out to me at management at djbjmotivationalmedia.com and we can make sure that we can get this to happen. Now, uh, we are highlighting on something that I picked up on uh, yesterday concerning oral tradition as it pertains to um, African history, black history, and even the history of many civilizations over a large span of time. Uh, for some reason, uh, it takes a lot of relearning. Uh, I already told you all, some of you all may be uncomfortable with some of the things that are said. I challenge you to take a breath. Uh, this is why this is on YouTube. You can easily pause it, come back to it, uh, because it's gonna shake you to the foundation of your core in terms of uh, basically relearning and decolonizing our viewpoint concerning history overall. So I just want to let you know that um, the tradition of or, uh, oral history uh, being a part and just as important as written history is absolutely vital to the construct uh, and the conversation that we're having today. Um, it is absolutely uh, probably one of the most overlooked forms of uh, historical um, information and its delivery and its format. Um, and uh, uh, we will be raising uh, many of these points throughout this lecture. And the oral tradition being absolutely vital to African, uh, the African continent and all those who uh, come from it. 
Uh, this is a absolute uh, uh, period in time in which um, we need to raise the diversity of oral tradition as it pertains to Black history. Now, uh, let's define what oral history is. Oral history is the practice of preserving or passing down historical knowledge, cultural traditions, and personal experiences through spoken narratives, all right? And the significance of this is that oral history has been made vital, uh, a vital means of preserving African heritage as it predates uh, written records for centuries, for centuries. So uh, to discount a, a long-standing tradition of uh, keeping track of the historical narrative and the culture of one's history uh, cannot be discounted. There are so many cultures, even outside of the African culture, that highlights the oral traditions as uh, uh, very pertinent, even a religious context. And uh, for me, I, I come from a Christian perspective, um, the oral traditions of the, of the Bible and the Hebrew narratives uh, were meant to be passed down in the oral format until it got to a point where it was quite necessary to actually write down uh, the traditional stories and the narratives and the history of um, that time period. So it is not just an African tradition uh, that uh, oral uh, knowledge and history is passed down and that is crucial. As a matter of fact, Africans in particular have used oral storytelling to convey history, moral lessons, cultural values, and that tradition has maintained uh, the identity of Africans and the diaspora, uh, the diaspora uh, throughout even enslavement. Storytelling is absolutely vital to the to the heartbeat of the African American community at large, especially through song. Uh, through plays, through uh, the written uh, format of poems and literature. Um, and uh, this skill set uh, comes from a tradition uh, in Africa in which there are individuals known as griots. Repeat that word with me, griot. Uh, to be a griot is an individual who uh, has really um, carried a crucial role in the resistance of movements and the preservation of the culture, the movement, the tribes. Oftentimes, the, the griot would travel from one tribe to the next. Uh, a contemporary griot continues in that vein to contribute the preservation of African and Black history, like I said, through music, through storytelling and education. Oral history tradition and the role of the griot in African and Black history are essential components of the cultural preservation of our history and identity. These traditions go hand in hand. These traditions have also ensured the rich history, heritage, and the values of the African and Black communities are passed down from generation to generation in order to celebrate and to honor uh, one's culture. So I just want you to take a step back um, and to uh, reflect on the stories of those Black Americans and uh, Africans and those stories that have gone unwritten, but the truth is they have not gone untold. Uh, more times than none, they were passed down. And due to the disruption of uh, this next section that we're about to get into, um, it causes a rift. Uh, between a, a heartbeat of one community and dividing it, uh, the brothers from sisters, from cousins to aunts to uncles to grandfathers to grandmothers, being separated and sold and dying uh, on a on a traversing trail to a land that was not their home. So it is at this point uh, that we uh, jump into the next section of our uh, lecture comparing ancient slavery and race-based slavery. And it's at this point that I am gonna ask um, that if uh, this is a disclaimer, uh, that we will be discussing again, uh, very uh, crucial topics uh, that may you may find disturbing uh, or triggering. If you are find that point, please press pause, take a break, 
breathe, take a step back, because we realize that the information that we are providing uh, to many, um, just the truth is that the nation is divided about the fact that I'm even delivering a Black History lecture. It, it is uh, found itself to be uh, quite controversial uh, in terms of uh, even uh, highlighting the history of my personhood. Uh, so, uh, so as it is for you, it is for me in terms of uh, grappling with a topic that is very close, near, and dear to me as it impacted my personal family. And I'll talk about some examples uh, of uh, where this happens and, you know, kind of narrative of my personal story as it pertains to uh, the larger story of Black history. But I do want to let you know that we are about to handle and really uh, grapple uh, a topic that um, you may not have addressed in your regular history classes from your K through 12 or even college level courses. So let's do this, all right? So comparing ancient slavery and race-based slavery. So uh, it'll be fundamental for us to uh, address the distinct forms of slavery, uh, the ancient versus the race-based slavery and by understanding these differences, we can gain an insight into the unique historical perspectives that have shaped each practice, all right? So when we look at the characteristics of ancient slavery, we have to look at a few things. Uh, this form of slavery existed before the Europeans um, came. So the ancient version of slavery existed well before Europeans uh, showed up to the African continent, but it was not about the color of one's skin. Okay? So I just want to be clear about that. It wasn't about the color of one's skin. Okay? Um, it happened because in the ancient days, slavery um as I mentioned in part one, could happen in, ha happen in a myriad of ways. It could have been based on uh, warfare, which most of it was about, um, and paying back the debt. So there's a economic, there's always been an economic connection to ancient slavery and race-based slavery. So those are two things that are in common. But it was usually done uh, for a defined period of time next we will address when uh the early uh europeans uh got to the african continent uh the the historical impact and their why and the reasons uh concerning that so we'll come back to that one but another characteristic uh for ancient slavery was again economic basis which was basically primarily driven on economic factors such as debt repayment conquest or a punishment of some sort, but it would be a limited time. Uh, the next part was that it was not race-based. So here's where it gets contrasted, right? So ancient slavery had a diverse impact. It was mostly about where you lived. In the ancient days, um, the there was very many different individuals of very varying ethnicities that could have lived in any location at any point in a certain location and that and it was normal it was not uh, something that was strange um during these times but if you found a location to be your home you and uh, you unfortunately were uh in on the losing side of a given war you could find yourself in a a, a point of servitude uh which they referred to as uh, slavery during that time uh also in ancient slavery uh, and the the contrasting characteristic is that there was a potential for social mobility for the most part. Uh, in ancient slavery, uh, you could attain your freedom and uh, even gain full citizenship uh, within the new nation that you found yourself in. Um, these are, again, I'm not addressing every single issue, and I just want to be extremely clear. Uh, you know, we have to always constantly give disclaimers these days, but, you know, I'm not talking about every situation. But in general, ancient slavery uh, was a lot broader of a situation, uh, and it also had a uh, foreseeable way out 
most times, not all, but most times, depending on what the situation was. Um, and also, um, it was, again, a relatively limited duration period of time. It was not usually lifelong. Uh, so in terms of the uh, geographical scope of slavery and enslavement, ancient enslavement, uh, enslavement happened around the Mediterranean Sea, uh, which is where uh, a lot of, uh, really the center of the, the world uh, for the most part and for a very long time had been dubbed uh, during those times uh, in which um, you see a mixture of racial ethnic groups. It just really was not that surprising to see the diversity of any individual in any given location, uh, including uh, various religions. And that's gonna become a crucial point uh, that I will highlight very briefly in terms of the justification of race-based slavery and differing it from ancient slavery. But in terms of ancient slavery, uh, there also have been categories surrounding uh, capture and ransom. It also resulted in um, shipwrecks, could have been in capture at sea, uh, and uh, even in those situations, usually it's a limited duration. And after a while, a certain period of time, those individuals were free to go home to their families or religious groups. Uh, and also, uh, if there was a ransom to be paid, uh, oftentimes you'll, you know, that's also another way out of uh, enslavement during ancient slavery. Again, temporary condition for the most part, uh, rather than a permanent situation. So uh, the perceptions uh, within ancient society uh, generally view slavery as a result of a misfortune or uh, one circumstance. It was not an inherent condition based on uh, whether or not an individual uh, their personhood was in question, which often came up and became eventually a, a very large excuse uh, for uh, the enslavement of uh, folks from the African continent. Uh, their personhood was in question at one point, okay? Uh, whether or not they were, quote unquote, the use of the word civilized and civilization is the most triggering word uh, in, on the planet because it was used to really uh, demonstratize um, individuals, in particular, uh, indigenous populations throughout uh, the world. Uh, and um, in terms of the individual um, being able to uh, become free, it often also could have been determined uh, by, the, by the government or the state itself. So there were those moments uh, in time that uh, could determine one's freedom in ancient slavery or not. So by the late 1500s and beyond, there is a major shift. Now this is this is um, a crucial moment in this lecture. So now we're shifting to race-based slavery. So we highlighted ancient slavery and its differences and some of the similarities. But now we're taking a shift. We're gonna look at the motivations that was had uh, during this time to justify the enslavement of African uh, individuals. Um, uh, through um, a myriad of reasons, and there are many reasons why it continued, uh, but uh, the motivation behind uh, the idea of enslaving individuals perpetually for a lifetime and the treatment on top of that is just absolutely uh, uh, horrific uh, as time goes on. And, we're gonna get into uh, why these motivations shifted uh, during these times and the perceptions. So unlike ancient slavery, race-based slavery was justified by racial ideologies that depicted Africans as inherently inferior. Slavery became more than just uh, one's natural misfortune. It, be, it began to question the humanness of those that came from the African continent. 
if you took my race and ethnic studies class, we would have gone uh, much deeper into the theories and the pseudosciences uh, that began to be developed during this time period uh, to try to separate uh, individuals uh, based on skull measurements and so on. Just uh, really comparing one ethnic group to another to see who is uh, really the human closest to perfection, which ultimately raises whiteness to that closeness to uh, perfection and uh, the, the creation of origin stories of, uh, you know, individuals coming from the Caucasus Mountains as uh, being the space for which humanity actually uh, draws itself from, which is not true, uh, by far not true and unfounded. But, uh, you know, that, that would be covered in a race and ethnic studies class and we don't have much time to get into that. But I do want you to know that there are movements happening to justify why um, uh, this construct of whiteness um, has become weaponized uh, in, in terms of making enslavement uh, duration of uh, permanence uh, for those uh, coming from the African continent. Uh, and uh, that being uh, race-based um, in nature. Now, we're getting to uh, the next part of this lecture, and we're moving right along into motivating factors for the transatlantic slave trade. And now, some of them are much more obvious, and I'm, I'm going to still name them, but others of them were less obvious. Um, we're going to uh, wax religious for a moment to talk about the institution of the Catholic Church and how um, they uh, really began to use its power and uh, if this was a history course concerning uh, European history, you would find the impact of the Catholic Church being one of many. It, it was a government of, of itself, and many of the royals uh, reported itself and uh, did not make general moves without the blessings of that pope uh, or leader of the time of the Catholic Church. So um, uh, you will find that uh, countries such as Portugal, and Spain, all right, and the Dutch, um, having uh, really trying to find justifications to increase the, the slave trade because most those three groups in particular um, were known for their trading routes. Uh, but in particular, the Portuguese and the Spanish um, uh, reported to the Catholic Church and they sought the blessing of the Catholic Church, and the Catholic Church was absolutely funded um, uh, by the slave trade. And you know, and I know that's a bit jarring for some to to realize, but we have to. This is one perspective of uh, a motivating factor for uh, Portugal and Spain, in particular, to feel like they were blessed and called to to do this work. Uh, and we will get into uh, the Eurocentric Christianity through the eyes of uh, Pope Nicholas V, who issued a papal decree that granted Portugal the right to enslave sub-Saharan Africans. And um, you'll likely not be able to um, uh, see the wording of this papal decree of Pope Nicholas, who issued uh, the right uh, for individuals um, who were involved in the slave trade to continue it. Uh, the church leaders argued that slavery surged, uh, served as a natural deterrent, and by Christianizing, uh, it, be, it would influence what they called, and this is a direct quote from the papal decree, which we'll get into uh, a little bit in a few seconds as barbarous okay and the behavior is uncivilized and um, calling every African essentially in sub Saharan Africa uh, pagan uh, now we have to briefly talk about uh, the, the church history <laughs> and it, it's just very interesting to me uh, that a uh, that 
a pope who very well knows that the early church fathers uh, weren't African. They were African, okay? Um, so it's just interesting how uh, even the church itself turns on its own uh, and the earliest forms of Christianity could be found throughout Africa, even during this time. So uh, we're going to get to a point where we hit the tension of, okay, so as a matter of fact, let's jump to the papal decree so we can address this tension right now. All right. So we have an excerpt in Latin, which is what uh, it was written in. But I'm going to read to you the English translation. And I, I apologize for the text uh, being so small. We'll address that in the future uh, lectures. But for now, I'll read it. We therefore weighing all and singular the premises do mediation and noting that since we have formally by other letters of ours granted among other things free and ample faculty to aforesaid King Alfonso to invade, search out, capture, vanquish, and subdue all pagans whatsoever and other enemies of Christ wheresoever placed and the kingdoms, dukedoms, principalities, dominions, possessions, and all movable and immovable goods whatsoever held and possessed by them and reduced their persons to perpetual slavery. This is a papal decree, uh, and many of these individuals who navigated the globe, and by the way, you know, we should note that some of them were pirates, uh, but with this papal decree, now the government's going to get on the action to try to get that funding too, and to get their hands in the pocket of uh, uh, stealing and kidnapping and uh, really uh, stealing the resources of the African continent and its people. So the first explanation as to motivations is they they receive the blessings of the mate, the world power of the Catholic Church officially through papal decree. So that's the first explanation as to why they would continue in this action. A second explanation is that Africans ended up being taken as prisoners of war between African tribes. Now, this is going to become a little shocking. And again, if you hadn't really thought this through, you might not have realized that there were even Africans um, of different varying locations that were too involved in the facilitation of uh, the enslavement of other enemy African tribes. Again, in, the, in part one, I told you that Africa is not just one big government. It is the continent that has millions of people on it and thousands of countries in present day based on colonial drawn lines. Uh, but many thousands difference of tribes that exist um, throughout the earth, all right? So, um, yeah, there are going to be some enemies uh, going back. So, again, when I'm calling upon individuals to uh, review the full history, we have to look at the good, the bad, and the ugly. So, yes, there were facilitation of individual Africans uh, in the tribes amongst themselves. The primary reason being was about money and the facilitation of that. Again, there were enemy tribes. Um, prisoners of war, as I already mentioned, uh, were taken and then sold to Europeans. Uh, truth be told, it it is a strong possibility amongst the earlier uh, trading that uh, Africans involved in this trading had no idea what type of enslavement these individuals were actually going to. Uh, so I will say for quite some time, 
the perpetuation of this cycle continued mostly because they had no idea where they were going. And most of them were headed to the Americas of which most people didn't even realize there was a new world, quote unquote. Uh, especially if you hadn't traveled uh, 10, 15 miles from your own home, which is the usual um, average human being on anywhere uh, during that time period. So it is not uncommon like anywhere else in the world for the winning of one tribe to uh, work over another one. All right. Uh, so Africans were end up being taken as prisoners of war and held then sold to Europeans and then ultimately been sent uh, to the Americas. So uh, also it was not uncommon to have slave raiders through the use of cover of tribal warfare tactics. So there was quite a bit of deception that began during this time period. So this gets us to a great pivoting point and a landing spot for part three of the Black History Lecture Series. I am so excited that you have decided to take this journey with us. Part three, here we go. We're going to begin to look at examples of different kingdoms that resisted, okay? Oftentimes, we overlook the fact that no African person on the continent didn't fight. They, Of course, they fought, okay? Uh, and I, I feel like uh, oftentimes in history, it just seems like uh, there's this idea and this notion that folks went away willingly. And that is just simply not the truth. We're going to get to the truth, and the bottom line is there was absolute resistance, although there were individuals uh, throughout uh, this time period that um, helped facilitate the issue. But there were more resistance than there was support uh, for the enslavement of uh, African individuals leaving that continent. So for part three, get ready. We're going to go through a, some examples. We're going to raise some names and some families and some kingdoms uh, that resisted every step of the way. But they also used diplomacy, strategy, uh, the ultimate strategy point. And we will also highlight uh, what were some of the technological advances that had occurred versus what the African uh, individuals on the African continent was experiencing. We have to remember all of the metals, the resources came from the African continent uh, and left out. So what was being created uh, during the industrial period, the early industrial period, that began to technologically um, really convince Africans that uh, they needed to uh, come up with alternative strategies of resisting uh, this type of oppression and enslavement. So again, I am Daryl Brackeen Jr., uh, the author of The Almost Forgotten, uh, asking that each and every one of you follow us on Brackeen TV on all social media platforms. You can also follow me at Daryl Brackeen Jr. on any platform. If you have any questions or thoughts or comments, feel free to email us at management at djbjmotivationalmedia.com. Again, uh, this is not about othering. This is simply about raising the untold stories uh, that often have gone overlooked within our uh, history classes and within our communities. It's time that we embrace uh, all of the untold stories and it increase the diversity that's absolutely necessary uh, to make this a greater loving society. See you next time.